Our next presenter is um, going to bring uh, be a, a domestic uh, talk. In uh, fact, it's going to be an, a Kentucky uh, talk. Uh, it's going to be a hometown talk, and that is uh, Rachel Mason is going to talk about the opportunity um, of her in her second year to being able to go uh, to Bell County and to uh, do some work for uh, a major entity in Bell County. Rachel Mason from Bell County. So as you said, my name is Rachel Mason. I'm a senior ag and natural resources major. And uh, we're both funders of the EPG program. Um, EPG for me has had a major concentration in social media and digital technology. When I first came to Berea um, in 2009, I was enrolled in Dr. Hackbert's GSTR 110 class. And the first day he told us that uh, if we were not willing to be creative or work hard, that we need to go find another class. And I thought, well, this guy's crazy, but uh, I stuck around and found that uh, this is the place to be. This is where the contacts are made and it, initiatives begin, and it's just where things get done. So my story begins with that GSTR 10 class, 110 class, back in the day. Uh, since that time, I've participated in four conferences, one in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Lexington, Kentucky, Georgetown, Kentucky, and Phoenix, Arizona. Most of those were centered around the idea that digital technology, uh, smartphones in particular, are making waves in the tourism industry. So I thought, this, this is pretty awesome. I, I applied for EPG and was accepted. And that's when the real fun began. But before we begin, let me uh, give you some handouts. My resume and a summary of my abilities. And a couple of few things. So, my first summer, I'll wait. Yeah, if you're here to see me, sign the sheet. You gotta sign the sheet. They don't sign the sheet, okay? She hasn't executed the close. <laughs> so, meet Michelle. In my first summer of EPG, I worked with several businesses at workshops that we hosted. One such business was the Potting Shed in Berea, a gardening venture that sells plants, tools, and other awesome things. Uh, the owner, Michelle, had created a Facebook, she didn't, but she didn't understand the implications of managing it for her business. So in order to guide Michelle, I had to learn how to do this myself. So through the help of social media guru Aaron Sachs, who's also a graduate of Berea College, co Cohort 8 uh, delved in deep into the crevices of social media marketing. So this was indeed engaging complexity and uncertainty for me because I didn't know any more about social media than your grandmother. So, working with Michelle exercised my skills in ways that uh, I didn't think, you know, I didn't know existed. It tested my ability to teach others my strengths in understanding the content myself and uh, how to communicate in a form that is memorable. So, the Potting Sheds Facebook is still really active today and they put up lots of really nice pictures of stuff that they grow and I think it's really good for marketing. And this is Martha and her sweet little dog, Pookie. After working with businesses in Berea, uh, my cohort went out into the, the real world, Eastern Kentucky. To give you some background, Eastern Kentucky, my definition, is a uh, culture of small town rural people who live for family and faith. And entrepreneurship in this area is few and far between. It's an incredible place with assets that have not really met their marketing uh, potential. But in these travels, I met Martha, and she was a member of several organizations, one being SNEAK, Spay Neuter Education for Eastern Kentucky. 
and it's a nonprofit that provides these services to to those who need it. Uh, my team met Martha as a, at a museum in Hazard, Kentucky, and she told us very quickly that she was not interested in going to our workshop at all. So we played with her dogs and looked around at the museum. And before we left, she had talked herself into coming, and so she showed up, and I uh, walked her through creating a Facebook page. And uh, it's still really active today too, and it has a decent level of engagement. And uh, all it took was a push in the right direction, and now more and more people are being educated about uh, pet population control. So, speaking of a push in the right direction, the book Switch, which we read in our first summer, How to Change When Change is Hard by Chip and Dan Heath, uh, it really set the ball rolling for me. It's understanding that the brain has two sides, the emotional side, which is the elephant, and the rider, which is uh, the rational side. And imagine the rider sits on top of the elephant. So change occurs when the elephant and the rider move in the, in the same direction at the same time or in the direction that you want them to go. So combine that with this really good philosophy that's best stated by Steve Chandler of the Kentucky Museum and Heritage Alliance. A destination's website and its digital footprint is its most important visitor center and is central to successful marketing. This statement has been central to the goals that I set in my second summer and coaching businesses my first summer. I learned the ropes of social media marketing, but in the second summer, I applied it. So imagine a national park nestled in the Appalachian Mountains of Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee, and then place me in the middle of it. That's where we begin. So they gave me this awesome uniform that I rocked out in. It's a volunteer <laughs> uniform. And people kept thanking me for volunteering, and I hated to tell them I was getting paid for this. But uh, I learned how to give out Junior Ranger badges, and I picked up trash on the walking trails, and I scheduled updates on Hootsuite, and I got out in the park and played a lot. And I went on cave tours and went to events and met a lot of Indians and went on Hensley Settlement tours with my good friend Ranger Graham, and it was a lot of fun. The, elef the elephant side of my brain was um, really enjoying itself, but you might ask, how does this apply to social media? Well, it's content, which is, you know, social media manager's best friend. It's, uh, on a business model, I guess you could call it value proposition. It's one of the most important aspects of marketing. Everyone loves national parks, and everyone uses social media, most everyone. As Steve Chandler would say, fish where the fish are, and that's the same guy I said earlier, national parks can only survive by the visitation they receive. That's how they get their, their funding. And, uh, Parks got to go to their tourists, not the other way around. So the first job I was given was to uh, manage the Friends of Cumberland Gap Facebook page. And I went from instructing others about Facebook to having to do it myself. And this is applying those, those skills. It had been a full year since I'd been trained, and I was really rusty. I couldn't even, I, I'd completely forgot that Hootsuite existed. And Hootsuite, by the way, is a social media managers really it's just their best friend you can schedule posts in advance to appear on your timeline it's some date in the future it's really handy it works for Facebook Twitter YouTube you name it but a change is necessary at the park they really didn't have a social media presence at all other than their website and this page which had really low statistics so but before we talk about that I'll let you in on a little secret Contrary to popular belief, your typical high school Facebooker does not have the expertise to um, manage a business's social media. So more than a few people scoffed at when I told them about the goals of my internship. I said, I'm here to work on Facebook. And they were like, well, couldn't we just get somebody off the street to do that? And I said, like, well, there's so much more to marketing that a 16-year-old doesn't, hasn't been exposed to. So take these statistics, for example. This is the levels of engagement that we received per week. Um, the whole time I was there, which was June to August, the page received 85 new likes, which is quite a bit, considering it's the Friends page and not the Cumberland Gap page. And 120 people connected with this page each, each week. And this is a really big deal, because uh, over 350,000 people 
were exposed to the posts I put up every day. So if you look at it, 300 people walk into a, the physical visit, visitor center every day, but virtually 350,000 people see a piece of the park every day. But uh, that wasn't really the difficult part. Uh, after some experimenting, I discovered that my audience absolutely loved pictures. They loved images. They didn't want to see anything else. And the highest level of engagement was actually from a photo album that was about the weekend's events. And uh, you have to give your audience what they want, or it's just not going to work. People are typically visual le learners. So as you imagine, it got kind of difficult for me because I didn't have a picture for every day and a really good picture that they would connect with. And there's only so much, so much you can say in a picture. So coming into the summer, I didn't really know how to use the statistics. I learned by trial and error, which was the test of my ability to engage in complexity and uncertainty. So I was fresh out of engaging content, and it was really scary. But uh, my next resource came in a really unusual way. Twitter. I knew nothing about Twitter, and but desperation led me to create an account. And this is the official Kremlin Gap Twitter page, and it looks really nice. I think. Uh, I followed all the other national parks I could find, and um, then I had all this news feed from them. It was miles long, it seems like, and they put up the coolest quotes, history facts, uh, pictures, and more interesting to me, uh, information about the national park system that I didn't know existed, like list of regulations and li list of other kinds. And I mobilized this resource to build the, the Friends Facebook page back up. I use Twitter to help Facebook, but that's not all. I played with blogs a little bit too. I found that creating a blog for the park was uh, not necessary at the time because I really struggled with blogs and I encountered problem after problem with it. And then I found this blog and it was about the park and it was managed by an official type person. I looked it over it, everything was right. Turns out it was made by a community partner of the park, so I thought, well, this is what I'll do. I'll just let the community partner do the blogging, and I'll just link it to Facebook occasionally. So I rest my case with the blogging. <laughs> but this was my way of facilitating a group decision, was sharing the workload. I don't know if you can see the picture. I worked with a large group of volunteers and park rangers. This isn't even half of them. Uh, pretty much every day, they were in and out all the time. And they're really very dear to my heart. The visitor center operated like a family. There was the annoying little brothers in the back there, and the wise veterans, and then there were the sister types who tried to set you up on blind dates. <laughs> and as you can see, the la my last day, they threw me a, a thank you party. And one of my favorite rangers, he couldn't resist. He had to tease me. He said, thank you, Rachel, for giving us an opportunity, an excuse to eat cake, ice cream, and pizza. So, anyway, during my, during my internship, I was so wrapped up in social media that the train was left the station. It wasn't slowing down for anything. So I made a promotional video for the park interviewing visitors about their experience. And I thought, well, this is the start of something big. I'm not going to show it to you, but you should look it up on YouTube. <laughs> All 25 of you. <laughs> so... The opportunity was YouTube. I finished the video and I made an account on YouTube. And then I found out that YouTube was against park regulation because of the advertising that was on YouTube and they can't be connected to any kind of advertising. I thought, I, I didn't mind to make a video every two weeks and it was going to be all this exposure and it was going to be awesome. and. And uh, so I was at a loss for a little while. And but then I found something that was really interesting. Um, an opportunity kind of threw itself at me, and I couldn't resist the challenge. Feast your eyes on Grand Canyon's official YouTube channel. Link directly to and from their website, so it's really official. Glacier National Park's official YouTube channel. Link directly to and from their website. I mean, even Yellowstone has one. So, 
this was the YouTube channel I created. It is not official, and it has no links to the website. Um, but, you know, this was a great opportunity to me. I was kind of scared of it, but I talked to the division chief at the visitor center over lunch, and she gave me kind of an idea. Um, at the time, it felt really drastic, and it made the, it was, you know, made me shiver, and, you know, my desire to advocate change over in my fear of being kind of reprimanded. I emailed Yellowstone and I talked to them, asked them, you know, what was the authority that they had to create a YouTube. And they said that the National Park System Service has a process for creating official park social media presences. The park must first have a social media strategy approved by their regional web coordinator. And they went through all this, you had to go through all that trouble just to have a YouTube that I already created. But uh, turns out YouTube was not against regulation. It was just unclear and foreign to this park and this particular park. So unfortunately for me, my internship ended soon after, after, after I received this, uh, this email. And my fear of un making unwanted waves kind of overcame my desire to advocate change. But uh, my elephant overcame the rider and just ran away. I was, I was really scared of uh, forcing them to do something they didn't want to do. Um, as many of you understand, you can't rush government. And this is government. But Dr. Hackbrick told me once in a Skype conference um, that I was not one of them. I'm not a member of their staff. I can only encourage them to do what I thought was a good thing to do and show them how to do it. But my values and ethical structures would not allow me to push them so far that it made things uncomfortable because it, it almost got there. <laughs> so and these are my friends that I didn't want to upset them. And I thought, you know, I might want to work here after school. So. so, so you might be asking, why is this important? It's just YouTube. Well, it's, it's just YouTube, but let's break it down. Take the unemployment percentages of the surrounding counties of the park. People are struggling to stay afloat. Most locals are chronically eligible for government assistance, food stamps and stuff, even the ones that are employed. So how does the park have the ability? The park has the ability to uh, affect this trend because National Park is a brand name. And many travelers come to Colonel Gap simply because they have this little passport book and they want this stamp. And the only place they can get it is at Colonel Gap and they get a free t-shirt if they get so many or something like that. So this park has an incredible potential to reach people. Last year, there were 829,000 visitors at Cumberland Gap. But another cool thing about national parks is that, there, is that there's several in the central Appalachian region, and travelers can research this out, and they can hit them all in one vacation. And one job I performed at the park was to meet and greet visitors as they walked through the door and I encountered several who they were just passing by and saw the signs on their way to the Smoky Mountains National Park. <laughs> the Smokies received nine million visitors last year. Nine, nine hundred thousand, nine million. What separates these two parks? Two hours of scenic driving time and some serious marketing. <laughs> so what if those nine million tourists made their way to Cumberland Gap? What do tourists do? They spend money, food, gas, souvenirs, and lodging, and the park doesn't provide any of that, so the locals around the park has to. Uh, it benefits local businesses, creates more jobs. And this chart's really cool. It tells the economic significance of national parks, their visitor spending on the local economy. So the amounts are in millions, and you see the local economy receiving a revenue of $14 million. And their fixed costs were $5 million. And so that adds up to about $8 million profit to local economies. And you might ask, well, how's YouTube tying to that? Active travelers spend more time online than using any other media. Facebook, YouTube, TripAdvisor, Yelp, Twitter, you name it, they're on it. So all businesses have to learn how to use this for, ev for everyone's benefit. But having a national park in your backyard has so much more benefit than the money. Uh, the park is a community of people who love their job. It's just, they radiate passion. Uh, 
preserving nature and interpreting history is just what they do. And uh, it's an addictive environment. I didn't want to leave, but uh, I didn't want to be that you know weird person who sticks around all the time. They have a few of those. <laughs> So it's, an, it's also an opportunity for youth to get involved into something important, you know, other than just going to the movies like most people, young people do in Bell County, because that's, that's all there is to do. But uh, this experience I've had in EPG has forever changed me. I actually find my major agriculture slightly boring in comparison. <laughs> so I found my niche. I just have to find my place in it. So who would like to ask the first question? Thank you.